Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to all of you as we gather in our Lord's name to hear his word. My uh, day began today in a very special, joyful way as I uh, was able to conduct the opening chapel for the brand new school year that began this morning. And so our school is filled with all bright, smiley faces. Uh, and I'm happy to tell you that the children seem to be very happy to be back in school, believe it or not. And so what a beautiful day uh, this has been so far. We are taking this week, because it is the new uh, school year, uh, to have our focus on Christian education. And so we're using the prayers and the readings uh, to celebrate Christian education. Our order of service today will be the service of morning praise. And we begin today's service by singing, Rise, Shine, You People. May you please stand. O Lord, open my lips. My mouth shall declare your praise. Hasten to save me, O God. The Spirit of the Lord fills the world. Let us worship him.
Please be seated. Today's psalm of the day is Psalm 78. It has always been the expressed will of God that the primary teachers of religious education are first and foremost moms and dads. Our first lesson comes to us from Deuteronomy chapter 11. And here, so much religious education, the teachings of the Lord take place in the home. Love the Lord your God and always carry out his requirements, his statutes, his ordinances, and his commandments. Know this today. I am not addressing your children who have not known and seen all these things, the discipline of the Lord your God, his greatness, his strong hand, and his outstretched arm, his signs and his deeds that he performed in Egypt against Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and against all his land what he did to the army of Egypt and its horses and chariots, how he caused the water of the Red Sea to flow over their heads when they pursued you, how the Lord has destroyed them to this day, what he did for you in the wilderness until you came to this place, what he did to Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, son of Reuben, how the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them with their households, their tents, and every living thing that was at their feet in the middle of all Israel. Know today it is your own eyes that have seen every deed that the Lord your God performed. Be careful or your heart will be deceived and you will turn away and serve other gods and bow down to them. Then the anger of the Lord will burn against you and he will close up the heavens. There will be no rain, the ground will not produce crops, and you will perish quickly from the good land that the Lord is giving you. Put these words of mine in your hearts and in your soul, and tie them on your wrists as signs and as symbols on your forehead. Teach them to your children by talking about them when you sit in your house, and when you travel on the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates, 
so that your days and the days of your children may be many on the land that the Lord promised to your fathers with an oath, as many as the days that the heavens remain over the earth. This is the word of the Lord. Today my sermon is based on our gospel from Matthew chapter 7. May you please stand for the reading of the gospel. Jesus says, Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on bedrock. The rain came down, the rivers rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, but it did not fall because it was founded on bedrock. Everyone who hears these words of mine but does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the rivers rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell. It was completely destroyed. Give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known among the nations what he has done. Please be seated. Our hymn of the day is, How Shall the Young Secure Their Hearts? Grace, mercy, and peace unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on bedrock. These words of mine, says Jesus. But why did he speak that way? You know, he could have said it quicker, easier. He could have just said, my words, my message, but he doesn't. He says, these words of mine. And that is the theme of my message for you today, these words of mine, these words of Jesus. And understanding why Jesus spoke this way helps us understand the significance of what he is telling us, the weight of his words. And what we know that is that Jesus' message is both a, both a beautiful promise, a promise of everlasting life, but they're also very much warnings of the dangers of hell. Today we celebrate Christian education, and our celebration focuses exactly where it should be, and that's right on those words of Jesus. Those words of Jesus, they can bring us that great joy, right? When things are going wrong, we hear those promises that Jesus speaks to us, and it brings joy to our hearts and to our minds. The words of Jesus can sometimes frighten us because he asks us to do bold things, things that are impossible, but he calls us to do the impossible. 
Sometimes the words of Jesus make people angry because he says things as they really are, and he exposes people and the sinners for what they really are. And so often the words of Jesus are so deep, so weighty, that we listen to them, we think about them, we meditate on them, we wrestle with them, and we never exhaust the deep meaning that they have. But always the words of Jesus have an impact. The word of God does indeed go out and accomplishes the purposes for which God has sent them. But before we dwell on why Jesus used that phrase, these words of mine, Let's be clear about what words are we actually talking about. In one sense, what we could say is these words of mine that belong to Jesus are the words of the Sermon on the Mount. Yes, the gospel right here in Matthew 7, these are the last words that belong to the Sermon on the Mount that began all the way back in Matthew chapter 5. It's a beautiful sermon. Remember the Sermon on the Mount that begins with the words of the Beatitudes. Blessed are those are the poor in spirit because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn because they will be comforted. Blessed are the gentle because they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness because they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful because they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart because they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, because they will be called sons of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And the sermon goes out. It's in this Sermon on the Mount that Jesus reminds us that we are the salt, the light of the world. It's in the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus calls us to pluck out our own eye or chop off our own hand if it need be to keep us out of the pains of hell. These are the words calling us to love our enemies. These are the words that remind us to cast all our anxieties on God because he truly cares for us. It is within the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus teaches us the Lord's Prayer. These are all found in the Sermon on the Mount. These words of mine, says Jesus. But are they only these words or is it only the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus is talking about? You see, so much of what Jesus speaks about and preaches in the Sermon on the Mount deals with life in this world. This is how you treat other people. This is how you deal with your money, your possessions. This is how you are to pray. This is how you are to speak, and the list goes on. And the Sermon on the Mount is not about salvation per se. Up until we get to the words before us today, up until the very end. And that becomes very clear that this is indeed what Jesus is talking about, words of salvation. And so it would also be right to say and put into these words of mine of Jesus everything that he says. Indeed, the words of the whole Bible, because the words of Jesus are words of life. Just think about how often Jesus directs our attention to the Word. He says, The Spirit is the one who gives life. The flesh does not help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit, and they are life. And Jesus does not hesitate to proclaim the forgiveness of sins and life given through the Word. Jesus says, You are already clean because of the Word I have spoken to you. And so whether it is the Sermon on the Mount or really any words of the Bible, they are all the words of God, the words of Jesus, the words of utmost significance because they are the words of life. And they are all so weighty. You know, right after today's gospel, there's the response of the people, the people that heard this whole Sermon on the Mount. And what Matthew tells us is that the people were amazed. And literally what it means is they were out of their senses. What they heard Jesus preach and proclaim was so overwhelming, they were overcome. You know why? Because the words and the things that Jesus was talking about were words that could come only from the mouth of God. Whether one winds up in heaven or hell, 
is determined by how they handle or mishandle the words of Jesus. These words are important. You know, what a joy it is to know that our Emmanuel Lutheran School is filled with teachers that have been trained in the Word of God. That they have that as part of their education, their training, part of what it means to be a teacher at our school. And of course, they, they know how to teach math and science, language arts, all of these different things. And let's face it, those are very important subjects to teach. But they all pale in comparison to when our teachers lead those little children to Jesus. And they teach him about how much God loves them and what God has done for them and how they have life in his name. Our teachers share the word of God to every student in their care. They lead him to the cross of Jesus. They lead him to that empty tomb. They lead him to their Savior. And how precious is that? You know, right now in our nation, there's about 40 million, roughly, elementary-aged school children. And out of all of that 40 million, about only 12 to 15 percent attend anything that is a private school. And not, of course, not every private school is religious in its background. And just think about how small of a percentage that is of the children that are in these formative years of learning about how to be a person, a citizen, a husband, a wife, a mom and a dad, an employee. 90 plus percent of children in those formative years don't have that religious aspect. And doesn't that show in our nation? Doesn't it really coming across that the type of nation we are more rapidly becoming, the callousness of life, the frivolity that people spend their days on, because they haven't heard the gospel. They haven't heard of Jesus. Imagine that over 90% of the children of our country, they grow up in those formative years in schools, and there's no talk of concepts like sin, grace, salvation, and afterlife. None of that. You know, there was a time in our country where everybody was exposed to the Bible. Certainly not everybody was a Christian in our country at any point. I'm not saying that. But it was part of our cultural identity. This has been time and time again called a Christian nation. And not lightly. And then you know from personal experience, there was a time where you could count on that even if somebody was not active in a church, that at least, at minimum, when they were young, that they were very likely at a church. And so when you talked about things like God or used words like sin or even thought about and talked about things of an afterlife, there was that frame of reference and people knew what you were talking about. And now those days seem to be behind us. When I was in Moline, my previous congregation, I ended up meeting a, an individual, this young man in his 20s. And what completely shocked me was that he had never been in a Christian church. Isn't that sad? And so the very concepts of what it means to be Christian were all new to him. And there's so many people in our world right now that don't even have a basic concept of the things that God has taught us. How precious our Christian school is. And we should never take it for granted. I want to go back to that opening thought, though. I believe that when Jesus uses that special phrase, these words of mine, he is not only reinforcing a simple truth that what he just spoke is the very word of God, but there's also, I believe a warning about how those words could be misused. You see, when Jesus calls them these words of mine, it's like they have some kind of an identity outside of himself. It's kind of a weird way to talk about it, right? But that is the warning. That is the warning that Jesus is sharing with us. That his words, 
by some can be divorced from Jesus himself. They only deal with the words and they don't deal with Jesus who speaks the words. And what a terrible thing, what a tragic thing, what a spiritually deadly thing that is to hear the words of Jesus divorced from Jesus who spoke them. And what Jesus reminds us is that deadly thing can occur even within churches itself. You see, in today's gospel, Jesus is not speaking to the outside world. He's preaching a sermon. He's talking to people that are hearing him. And in this sense, when they are hearing him, they're hearing the word of God. He's not talking about the outside world, that outside world that never hears the word of God. They have no hope. They have nothing that can bring them everlasting life. But Jesus here is talking about individuals that receive the word of God. And there's such a big difference between the two groups that he talks about. You know, there's one group that hears the words of Jesus, but they don't do them. And yet there's this other group that both hears the words of Jesus, but they also do them. And Jesus uses this picture of a house. And what he's talking about in this picture of the house is what a human life is. You know, we all need to have a place in this world. We all need to have a house, a home in this world. And we spend all of our time and our efforts in building up that house, our place in the world. And what Jesus is talking about is that house is a person's life. Everything that they have in this world. And a storm comes. And it's a powerful storm. And there are some people that their lives don't withstand the storm. And there are other people that do withstand the storm. And when those that don't withstand the storm, what happens to them is they're not just hurt, they're not just damaged, but they are completely destroyed. And the point of what Jesus is talking about is something that is ultimate and final. He's talking about death. He's talking about eternity. Only that spiritual death that happens after somebody physically dies is a complete destruction. You know, hearing the words of Jesus is necessary for our salvation. But Jesus tells us that simply hearing is not enough. One must hear and one must do. You know, it's so easy to be around the Word of God. It's easy for people to show up at church and hear voices talk. It's easy, actually, believe it or not, to go through a school, a Christian school, and be around that Word of God. And you can have homework assignments, and that homework assignment assigned to the Bible can be just like a math assignment or anything else, and the words are there, and you, you fill out your worksheets. But something is lacking. And it's so easy to have the Word of God in our homes, and these special Bibles, maybe even a Bible on display. But there it sits. Hearing the word is not enough. Jesus calls us to do it. What is happening when people only hear the word of Jesus and they don't do it? You know what's happening is they are separating the words of Jesus from Jesus himself. To come to church and to hear the sermon and not be convicted of the law is to hear the word of God, but not do it. To hear the words of Jesus, that he died for you on the cross, and not have a deep abiding joy, and not to have hope in your life, is to hear the word of Jesus, but not to do it. The words calling you to radical holiness is a message of God. And to just think of it as words is not enough in the eyes of God. You know, it's so easy to be around the Word of God and just think of it as something as an idea or a thing. Something that we can hear, something that we can contemplate, and all too often something that we can set aside for when we think we need it down the road. 
You know, take your pick out of anything that Jesus preaches in the Sermon on the Mount. For example, just think about what he says about the topic of anger. Jesus, in that sermon, he says, You have heard that it was said to people long ago, You shall not murder. And whoever murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that everyone who is angry with his brother without a cause will be subject to judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, will have to answer to the Sanhedrin. But whoever says, you fool, will be in danger of hellfire. So if you are about to offer your gift at the altar and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. So often people can hear that preaching, that message of Jesus, and they treat it as just as an idea, as something to be pondered, as maybe something that is so lofty and unattainable that we don't have to do much with it. That's hearing, but not doing the Word of God. But Jesus does not just tell us to do the Word of God in the sense of turning us to our own works. There's something far deeper in what Jesus is talking about in today's gospel. Jesus is talking about a life lived in him, a real life, a life that is the recipient of God's grace, and it is a life that is built on something else, on a rock, on bedrock, to do the words of Jesus is to hear Jesus, to believe in him, to rely on him, to trust on him for absolutely everything and to receive his grace. Listen closely to what Jesus says. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on bedrock. The rain came down, the rivers rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, but it did not fall because it was founded on bedrock. What is that bedrock that Jesus talks about? It's Jesus. And it's that bedrock, it's Jesus that gets all the credit for one being saved. It's not in the house, it's not in that person's life. It's the bedrock, it's Jesus. That's the only source of life. That's the only way to survive the storm of death. Jesus and Jesus alone saves. And it's interesting, the very same word that Jesus uses, the word bedrock here, is the word later that Paul is going to use in 1 Corinthians. And he uses that word in the context that it was God, it was the rock, it was Christ who saved the Israelites out of Egypt and took them through the Red Sea. It's that bedrock of Jesus that alone saves. Anything else, no matter what it is, is sand. It's sinking sand, according to that beautiful hymn. To only hear the words of the Lord's Prayer, which is part of the Sermon on the Mount, is to hear a lesson about a possible way of praying. But to, to hear and to do the words of Jesus, which are the Lord's prayer, is to pray. To pray to your heavenly Father because he is your Father, because Jesus first became your brother and died for your sins, and because you can pray because of who you are in Christ. To do the words of Jesus is to fight against sin. And when it all seems so overwhelming and things seem lost, it means to have that feeling of mourning. But then to be brought back to Jesus who says, blessed are those who mourn. It's all about Jesus. Today we all take joy that our school doesn't talk about Jesus or just throw out the words of Jesus as good rules to live by or as good thoughts to think no. Our school shares the words of Jesus, the words of God, as things to be lived, as things that we put into practice, as things that we model, as things to be relied upon and trusted for as the only source of life itself. This is the proper use of these words of Jesus, and nothing short of this is worthy of the label Christian education.
Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please remain seated as we'll now continue by singing, We Praise You, O God. May you please stand. In the morning, O Lord, I call to you. Be merciful to me and hear my prayer. I'll be including some special petitions in today's prayers. One of our little lamb workers, uh, Tammy Earl, it was her son that died in a car accident on Sunday just three days ago. And uh, his name was Hunter Joe Reed. His uh, funeral will be at Hemer on uh, Sunday. And so we'll be praying for Tammy and going through that uh, mourning loss. And I'll also be praying for my own uncle, Patrick. Uh, he was diagnosed with uh, advanced cancer and be lifting up our prayers for him. Dear Lord, we give you praise and thanks for our Emmanuel Lutheran School and for our little lamb child care. May you lead and bless our teachers as they faithfully teach your precious word of salvation to each and every student. Guide our teachers and all of us that we may exhibit lives of grace and faithfulness, resting solely on the righteousness of Jesus our Lord. We pray, dear Lord, that you continue to grow the faith of those students who have saving faith in you. And we pray your work of conversion in those who do not yet have faith. May the Holy Spirit enter their hearts and minds as you make them your very own. Lord, we remember the family of Hunter Joe Reed, who has been taken from them by death. 
we ask that you would comfort Tammy, Hunter's mother, and to give her the strength necessary at this time of grief. Surround Tammy and the other family members during this time of loss with those who can assure them of the love of Christ for them. And may this death remind all of us how quickly our lives here in this world may come to an end. Dear Lord, we lift up to your grace and ask your healing upon Patrick Lenecki as he is treated for cancer. Guide the doctors and physicians treating him and strengthen Pat's faith through these difficult times. If it be your will, dear Lord, heal him of this illness. And in the assurance that it is your will, allow him to find peace, confidence, and the assurance of everlasting life in you, because Jesus died for him as his Savior. Almighty God, you have committed to your church the task of making disciples of all nations. Enlighten with your wisdom those who teach and those who learn, that rejoicing in the knowledge of your truth, they may worship and serve you from generation to generation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated as we sing hymn 538.
please stand. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have brought us safely to this new day. Defend us with your mighty power and grant that this day we neither fall into sin nor run into any kind of danger. And in all we do, direct us to what is right in your sight through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Let us praise the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Please be seated as we sing, Lord, help us ever to retain. Again, good afternoon to all of you. One important announcement, uh, this coming Sunday, the 29th, will still be the Sunday for the call meeting for a new pastor, uh, but the time for that had to have been adjusted, so the call meeting will be this Sunday at 6 p.m., and I'll get a one call uh, on that uh, out tomorrow to the entire church. One of the vice presidents of our district, Pastor Jeff Silo, who who serves up in Rice Lake, he'll be conducting that meeting uh, on Sunday at 6. May God see you home safely this day, and may his peace be with you. I'll be greeting everybody at the back of the church. <laughs> 